foreign battlefields or laboratories for the architects of industrial slaughter. They perfect the tools of control and annihilation on the demonized and the destitute. But these tools eventually make their way back to the heart of empire. As the corporatists and the militarists disembowel our nation, rendering our manufacturing centers boarded up wastelands and tossing out citizens into poverty and despair, the methods of subjugation familiar to those on the outer reaches of empire migrate back to us. Wholesale surveillance, indiscriminate use of lethal force in the streets of our cities against unarmed citizens, a stripping away of civil liberties, a dysfunctional court system, drones, arbitrary arrests, detention, and mass incarceration. The tyranny empire imposes on others, as Thucydides reminded us, it finally imposes on itself. Those who kill in our name abroad soon kill in our name at home. Democracy is snuffed out. As the German socialist Karl Leibniz said during the First World War, the main enemy is at home. And we will destroy the engines of endless war and shut down the war profiteers or we will become the next victims. Indeed, many in our marginal communities already are its victims. You cannot be a socialist and an imperialist. You cannot, as Bernie Sanders has done, support the Obama administration's wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen, and be a socialist. You cannot, as Sanders has done, vote for every military appropriations bill, including every bill and resolution that empowers and sanctions Israel to carry out its slow motion genocide of the Palestinian people and be a socialist. And you cannot laud, as Sanders has done, military contractors because they bring jobs to your states. Sanders may have the rhetoric of inequality down, but he is a full-fledged member of the Democratic Caucus, which kneels before the war industry and their lobbyists. No genuine grassroots movement will ever be born within the bowels of the Democratic Party establishment. Because none of these elected officials dare challenge any weapon systems, no matter how costly or redundant. And Sanders, like all elected officials, profits from this Faustian pact. The Vermont Democratic Party leadership, in return for his deference, has not supported any candidate to run against Sanders since 1990. Sanders endorses Democratic candidates no matter how much they push neoliberalism down our throats, including Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. And Sanders carrying water for the Democrats is the primary obstacle to building a third party in Vermont itself. Now there is a reason no establishment politician will say a word about the war industry. Because if you do, you end up like Ralph Nader, tossed into the political wilderness. Nader was not afraid to speak this truth. And it is in the wilderness, I'm afraid, that real socialists must, for the moment, reside. Socialists understand that if we do not dismantle the war industry, nothing absolutely nothing will change. Indeed, things will only get worse. 
War is a business. Imperial wars seize natural resources on behalf of corporations and ensure the profits of the arms industry. And this is as true in Iraq as it was in our campaigns of genocide against Native Americans. As A. Philip Randolph said, it is only when it is impossible to profit from war that wars will be dramatically curtailed if not stopped. No one is sitting in the boardroom of General Dynamics hoping for peace in the Middle East. No one in the Pentagon, especially the generals who build their careers by managing wars, prays for a cessation of conflict. War, wrapped in the cant of nationalism and the euphoria that comes with a giddy celebration of power and violence, is used by ruling elites to thwart and destroy the aspirations of working men and women and distract us from our own disempowerment. Wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder, and that is war in a nutshell, said the five-time socialist presidential candidate Eugene V. Debs during World War I. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. Debs, who in 1912 received almost a million votes, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for saying this. I've been accused of obstructing the war, Debs said in court. I admit it. I abhor war. I would oppose war if I stood alone. Debs, who spent 32 months in prison, until 1921, also delivered to many a socialist credo at his sentencing after being found guilty of violating the Espionage Act. Your Honor, he said, years ago, I recognized my kinship with all living beings, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I say then, and I say now, that while there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. While there is a soul in prison, I am not free. The capitalist class and its doppelgangers in the military establishment have carried out what John Ralston Saul calls a coup d'etat in slow motion. The elites have used war as a safety valve for class conflict. For war, as W.E.B. Du Bois said, creates an artificial community of interest between the oligarchs and the poor diverting the poor from their natural interests. The redirecting of national frustrations and emotions into the struggle against a common enemy, the cant of patriotism, the endemic racism that is the fuel of all ideologies that sustain war, the false bonding that comes with a sense of comradeship seduces many on the margins of society. They feel in wartime for perhaps the first time that they belong, they feel they have a place, they are offered the chance to be heroes, and off they march like sheep to the slaughter. By the time they found out, it is too late. Modern totalitarianism can integrate the masses so completely into the political structure through terror and propaganda that they become the architects of their own enslavement, Dwight MacDonald wrote. This does not make slavery less, but on the contract, contrary more, a paradox 
there is no space to unravel here. Bureaucratic collectivism, not capitalism, is the most dangerous future enemy of socialism. War, as Randolph Bourne wrote, is the health of the state. It allows the state to accrue to itself power and resources that in peacetime a citizenry would never permit. And this is why the war state, like the one we live in, has to make certain that we are always afraid. Constant violence by the war machine, we are assured, will alone make us safe. Any attempt to rein in spending or expanding power will profit the enemy. It was the militarists and the capitalists at the end of World War II who conspired to roll back the gains made by working men and women under the New Deal. They used the rhetoric of the Cold War to cement into place an economy geared towards total war, even in peacetime. This permitted the arms industry to continue to make weapons with guaranteed profits from the state and permitted the generals to continue to preside over their fiefdoms. The incestuous relations between the corporatists and the militarists, see retired generals and officers, offered lucrative jobs in the war industry once they retire. The manufacturing of weapon systems and the waging of war is today the chief activity of the state. It is no longer one among other means of advancing the national interest but has become the sole national interest. And these corporatists and militarists are the enemy of all socialists. They bankrolled and promoted movements in the early 20th century that called for reforms within the structures of capitalism. They spoke that these movements that spoke in the language of, quote, the politics of productivism, that eschewed the language of class conflict, and talked only about economic growth and a partnership with the capitalist class. The NAACP, for example, was formed to lure African Americans away from the Communist Party, the only radical organization that in the early 20th century did not discriminate. The AFL-CIO was fed CIA money to help crush and supplant radical unions abroad and at home. The AFL-CIO, like the NAACP, is today a victim of its own corruption and bureaucratic senility. Its bloated leadership pulls down huge salaries as its dwindling rank and file is stripped of benefits and protections. And the capitalists no longer need what they once called responsible unionism, which meant pliable unionism. And once the capitalists and the militarists killed off the radical movements and unions, they finished off the dupes who had helped them do it. And that is why less than 12% of our country's workforce is unionized. It is why we have such vast income disparities and chronic unemployment and underemployment. 